Hi, everybody. I'm Dawn Zoldai, your host for the Dawn of Drones podcast. So great to see everybody out there. Just remember this is live, so please jump in the chat, tell us where you're from, ask your questions, give us positive encouragement. We love all of it. And we are in about the second week of February. Time is flying in 2022. And this is our Dual Use Technologies Month, kindly sponsored by Northrop Grumman. Uh, if you missed last week's podcast with Robert Menti, Colonel of the United States Army, retired from Northrop, talking about counter UAS, you can always find that and all of our other podcasts on demand on Drone Life TV. So go ahead and check that out. But today, we're so excited to have with us a company from Israel and its CEO, Oren Elkayem. Uh, so Mobilicom is the company. There's actually two companies we're going to talk about because Oren wears a lot of hats. Uh, but Oren, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So great to have you. And like I said, Oren is coming to us live from Israel. And our topic today, when we think about dual use technologies, is going to be focused primarily on not only smart end to end solutions, but cybersecurity when it comes to drones, robots, and autonomous platforms, which is really Mobilicom's bread and butter. So, Warren, before we get into cybersecurity in general and kind of what Mobilicom is bringing to the table on that, can you tell us a little bit about your own background? So, um, as everybody knows in Israel, uh, there is mandatory service for girls and boys in the age of 18. Um, I was lucky enough to be accepted to the unique program of academic reserve. Those are people that are doing their engineering and degree, okay, and yeah. bachelor degree. And later we are um, then going to the Israeli uh, West Point Officer School. Um, and then you are injected into elite R&D program. I was in the Israeli NASA um, operating different technologies in space, shooting elements to space, although Israel is tiny. Israel is one of the uh, top 10 uh, nations in space, uh, thanks to its uh, high-end technology and capabilities in cooperation with the United States. So I was lucky to be elected there. And from there, after I finished my army service, I continued to the tech uh, side of things in Israel, which is booming, obviously, and been there in several companies doing from silicon and chipset to cellular phone in new technologies, or base station solutions and nanopowder separation and Mobilicom is the latest things that we are doing for drones, robotics, and autonomous platforms. Got it. And you know, the fact that you were selected for this elite program speaks volumes about your abilities and your leadership. And Orin, we had a great conversation on Clubhouse last Thursday. And uh, if I recall correctly, pretty early on, just working with the Israeli uh, Ministry of Defense and some of the other government clients there in Israel, I think you came to realize pretty rapidly that cybersecurity is a huge issue uh, when it comes to uh, autonomous systems, especially in Israel, right? So can you kind of give us this context of the cyber like arena, if you will, operating in Israel? So I think that cyber is a great issue worldwide, and that's why it's booming in the last decade. I think that drones, robotics, and any autonomous platform uh, has much more challenges than banking or hospitals or other government agencies because they are going to be operated in the thousands simultaneously, distributed, operating uh, wirelessly. So the entire control and sharing and operation is done by wireless means, which means it's easier to tap, easier to uh, detect, easier to block or intervene. And that makes it very vulnerable by different means um, as an industry. And therefore, a new schemes of things in cybersecurity have to come in order to protect drones or robotics in their operation if we all want that this market will evolve and ramp up as we all expect it. It's mandatory to solve the issue and without it, volumes will not come. 
insurance company will not protect it. Agencies like FAA will not allow it. As soon as the first compelling events will happen, and we have it. In Israel, we've been, um, I'm not sure if to say lucky, but we are living in a bad neighborhood. We have uh, on the north Hezbollah, which has Iranian uh, elements of uh, jamming and intervention and blocking and operating against us. On the east-north side, we have Syria, where the Russians are operating there. And to protect themselves, they're operating quite a lot of uh, tech elements in order to uh, block things. And in the southwest, we have Gaza Strip with, again, uh, other organiz a terrorist organization working with Iran. So in this bad neighborhood, if you would like to have robots running across the borders and just making things uh, safe over there, or if you would like to do some surveillance monitoring, uh, are the things that you usually do with drones or robotics, you face a lot of challenges to the cybersecurity. It's either jamming or GPS, GNSS attacks, or it's spoofing and many, many other different attacks. And then we were called for the challenge by the Israeli MOD because of our experience in the drones or robotics for the last over five years. And we develop a new scheme just for that. So the bad neighborhood is always creating challenges that then create new technology that will then be used also in the commercial market. And this is where we came to cyber. Well, and that's exactly why you're perfect here for dual use technologies month. And, you know, it's really a great segue to kind of peel back some of these cyber threats. I mean, you mentioned the very specific ones basically surrounding Israel, but let's let's dig a little deeper into kind of what, what those mean, right? So you mentioned jamming in particular, and I know that is a significant challenge for the military. We've seen that globally, uh, you know, in particular with global, global navigation uh, and satellite systems or GNSS, in particular GPS uh, and systems that really control the direction, the position, navigation timing of so many vehicles uh, and so much of actually what we do just in civilian life. Um, what, what exactly is the jamming threat and why is that of particular concern for drones and robots? So I think that the problem with drones or robots is very comprehensive and we have more than 10 different attacks that we witness on the drones or robots. And there are, there, there are attacks that are attacking the platform, there are attacks that are attacking the data, and there are attacks that are attacking the networking or communication. And all of them are coming simultaneously sometimes. When we are talking about GNSS or GPS in particular, uh, as one of the uh, GNSS systems, for navigation, timing is done by that and so forth. Yes. Um, it's everybody knows what you are using. It's a very specific frequencies. It's easy to jam it. And then you have drones or robots that's supposed to walk, uh, to, to fly or drive across specific navigation. Uh, and they don't know where they are. If this is the timing, it cannot be synchronized to their systems. And that's a big threat. I, by manipulating the GPS, I can either stop your action, cause you to go back home, or cause you to land, or in more severe cases of spoofing and hijacking, I can give you, I can give you signals of GPS which are not true, and uh, by that cause you to do whatever I want. I can manipulate your operation, flight, and other things. You will think that you are going west, but you will actually come east. And I will definitely make you fly as, as, as I want. And by that, I'm practically controlling the drones or robots. And those things that you see on the military side for the recent years, if things like that were available in the past just for powerhouses and nations, now it's available even for organization and terrorists, easily could be bought online. And what's more uh, scary is that you find those things in the civilian market. There is some examples that uh, people don't think of that we see them happening. And I can give examples if you want. I do want to get to those before we do. I mean, let's just kind of back up for a second, right? So this cyber threat is real. I mean, we've seen cyber attacks, well, here in the United States, right, on our electoral process, uh, right, uh, using social media. Um, we've seen very specifically the GNSS GPS 
attacks in the Baltic Sea with military operations happening there, where a bunch of ships thought they were actually not at sea and looked like they were parked at an airport, which they were not. Um, we've seen, of course, uh, emanating out of Russia, a lot of these attacks, they're lining up at the Ukrainian border as we speak. Uh, we're just, you know, we saw um, the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict, and as uh, uh, Robert Menti talked about last week, uh, this networked kind of attack system uh, that was out there, and cyber is always a part of that. Um, and Oren, I believe, um, I don't know that we got to this in Clubhouse, but you had mentioned to me uh, that the Europeans had done a study from 2017 to 2019 called the uh, the task, let me look at this right, Strike 3 project. And uh, they studied for three years globally with 40 different uh, uh, different positions, 23 countries, uh, what was happening with GPS and GNSS, were there attack vectors coming in? And the answer was a resounding yes. And, and the really frightening thing is we were talking, I think you mentioned it's like about an hour of jamming per session and hundreds every day uh, to the tune of almost 60,000 just jamming attacks over that three year period. So, I mean, th this is a real thing just to kind of foot stomp that this. And, you know, you and I had also talked about this idea that the standards haven't quite kept up with the technology as in so many other areas, right? Whether it's, um, you know, beyond visual line of sight operations or remote identification is just now kind of coming online. Um, Europeans are a little bit ahead, I think, with regards to some cybersecurity standards. And I know you're a big part of that uh, at Mobilicom, so good on you. Um, let's, let's transition to the civilian sector because, um, you know, this isn't just limited to the military. Uh, you know, the electoral process aside, what are you seeing in the civilian side in particular? And I think that actually that strike, that uh, strike three focused not on military, it was actually civilian side. Uh, so tell me what you're seeing. So we've seen quite a lot. We are working with closely with the cyber authority in Israel, in Europe. Those are civilian organizations that are supposed to help civilian businesses and operation of estates a nation to survive and continue on a daily base against different threats that they see from the cyber side. And the, we were called out to help them craft the standards or the needs or understand the problem in the related to the drones and robotics uh, uh, segment of the market, because those are abundant and no one really took them into consideration planning their systems and they see problems all the time. I will give some example of a compelling event just um, a few months ago, there was a beer festival in China. Everybody, everybody knows those drones in the sky shows, which are magnificent. Someone operated a cyber attack against that. Over 40 drones fell from the sky on the crowd and on the city, creating a panic at, uh, among the crowd. Of course, a lot of damages and people injured and so on. That's one event that happened that will cause an effect after that of two specific items. First, no insurance company will then vouch or protect or, or insure the next show, okay? Because they don't want to take any such risk if they don't know that there is sufficient or good enough cyber protection against those elements. And obviously it's the same like no insurance company will protect the bank if the CSO, uh, the uh, chief security officer will not say that they, acted and did some cyber policies. No one is 100% protected, but at least something has to be done. So right. that's one thing. On the other side, no one like FAA or other regulatory bodies in Europe or in Australia or in China will allow that thing to happen above civilian uh, cities if they don't feel safe enough. So we see one regulators, one is the business um, insurance side that will eventually trigger some effects that will push the industry to have safety. The same thing, by the way, happened in the automotive industry. It wasn't, cyber wasn't part, part of the vehicles in the past, but today, any future car would come to the market has multiple cyber protection inside. So drones have to, have to take cyber into consideration. I can give you some other civilian things that are happening on a daily basis that we see. All of you are familiar with the, um, you know, big, 
uh, activity that drones, robotics, and autonomous vehicles can play in agriculture, sophisticated precision agriculture. And the John Deere companies of the world or Caterpillar are very, very advanced systems. They have autonomous capability. They can go by themselves. They can uh, design and do different programs that injected in, in pre-mission. They use, of course, GPS all the time to navigate and operate and work in fleets among them. There are several vehicles operating together. They witness quite a lot of different jamming or spoofing attacks that are happening on a daily basis or weekly basis that kill their business. If you have now and then every next day or two, one hour, two hours of such an event, you're unable to operate efficiently. Another thing that we are seeing in harbors, uh, people are operating trucks that are coming in and out of the harbors. The drivers are monitored by GPS to see that the fleet of this carrier or this uh, transportation agency to monitor the fleet. Drivers don't like to be controlled and, and monitored all the time, obviously. And they are buying online for $50 a jammer spoofer that you hook to your uh, electric uh, outlet in the car. And that's create a bubble around you that you don't receive GPS so your, your boss cannot see where you are. But then you drive with it into the harbor, getting closer to the ships. And people don't think that the cranes, which are automatic robots that take out uh, the different uh, cranes and, and other uh, merchandise from the boats are unable to identify where they are to be synchronized to the system and they are suddenly stopped working. And people think that it's a, an attack from you know, an enemy, but it's not. Right. It's a simple wow. thing. In London, there is over 17,000 poofer for GPS in taxi drivers. Enormous amount of, of elements. You so would you think, you would think the companies... You would think the taxi companies would be like, hold on a minute, you're not allowed to use these, or if you do, you're just you're just fired. But that's that's insane, uh, the extent of that. And you know, you're talking about ports, now you're talking about critical infrastructure, right? You're talking and even taxis, you're talking about transportation systems, which also is considered critical infrastructure. And you know, Oren, I was just this week at Geo Week 2022 up in Denver, Colorado. And just such amazing technology on the floor, you know, a lot of different scanners, you know, for uh, mapping, LIDAR, you know, 3D digital twins, lots of different artificial intelligence applications. And as I'm walking around this floor for a day and a half, I'm thinking, you know, Mobilicom should be here <laughs> because I don't know what cybersecurity they have for any of this. I mean, just think about that for a second. If you're flying through underground tunnels with a drone, there was a, a cool company that, that, has a, you know, that has a system that can fly in GPS denied environments like that. You're underground, you're mapping tunnels. And to the extent that somebody can spoof jam, take over that system, um, you know, the, the havoc that could be, or worse yet, let's talk about nuclear power plants, uh, right? Like just, just the idea that we, I think, as an industry, you know, and I say industry, you know, I'm talking about drones in particular at this time, um, you know, we, we kind of have that safety checklist of, you know, safety management system and make sure you have your certifications and your pilots are certified, you're running your checklist. But again, where on there is is the cybersecurity solution. So let's, let's talk about Mobilicom and um, basically, what what it is you do and how this you your new I know you have a newer cybersecurity suite called ICE, ICE, which is an acronym. Um, let's talk about Mobilicom first and explain kind of the genesis of the company and what what you all literally bring to the fight. So Mobilicom evolved over the years and developed different kinds of technologies and then decided uh, to focus all of its energy and all the assets of our patents and technology into the drones or robotic space, particularly focusing on the small drones and small robots segment, which is going to have a steep rise, both in the commercial as well as in the defense and government sides, like public safety, homeland security, as well as in the defense. And we, this is our focus. We are an end-to-end -end provider of the key building blocks or technology uh, elements within the drone or a robot. 
is you know any car or any vehicle much like drones are built from hundreds of pieces but only few of those systems are the critical smart pieces that sets the capability, the value, the operation, and actually make this drone capable of what it's capable to do. And we, there is a variety of elements like that. For example, you must have some data link or uh, networking for fleet or swarm to operate uh, your uh, drone, you know, control it, the telemetry uh, reception, as well as uh, uh, share the videos, data, or any sensors that you are collecting. There is uh, capabilities to have um, ground control stations or tactical means that to operate the mission. So the soldier or the firefighters or the operator of the security or inspection will be able to control the mission live and online. So that's another tool that we are, uh, another family of product that we are doing. Uh, we have entered new areas after extensive uh, development over the last three years. One of them is the cloud networking with assistance of cellular and non-cellular means to monitor, operate, and manage the networking of multiple fleets of drones by different geographical and operational means. And that's the tool that will enable the scalability. Operating drones here and there in the tens is okay. How do you do it in the hundreds? How you enable the operators and the customers or the user at hand to master the fleet, understand what is going on, both in real time, in offline, collect the information, analyze that, and be able to identify different things and operate it and, and manage it or, or even uh, have um, uh, maintenance and support and ILS packages post that. So our control it uh, cloud software solution enables you to do that. And last but not least is our I cybersecurity, which is a very unique and advanced solution. Uh, it's based on a heavy work that done with different government agencies uh, that are suffering on a daily basis from the most challenging uh, threats. We identify more than 10 different attacks, attacks on the data, attacks on the platform, and attacks on the networking and, and communication. And for each one of them, there are different attacks that you have to identify them when they are happening, detect it, prevent it, and responds automatically with tools that without intervention of the pilot or operator will take the threat down and enable you to continue with your mission or safeguard your operation and return it or operate also. So that's very important to do it automatically based on AI multimodal that we've developed and do it uh, in a smart way that identify many, many different kinds of attacks. And that's what makes us uh, unique. This 360 degree Multi-layer, multi-facets protection suits is uh, the key asset that we've built uh, for immunity, for cybersecurity, and for encryption uh, elements around it. So Mobilicom yeah. is actually provider of all the key building blocks that drones, robotics manufacturers can use, one, two, three, four of them, as they choose, in order to build their platform. All right, awesome. And by the way, we've got Steve Zirkel from Northrop Grumman jumping into the chat there. So, hey, Steve. Thanks again for uh, Northrop support this month. And they're all jumping in now. You get one and they, they all come. Uh, drone shows are mainly analog. Is this all digital is the question uh, or in from before you go? The question is again, please. Uh, so you mentioned the drone show in China and some attack that occurred that knocked about 40 of these drones out of the sky onto the crowd. The question from before you go, who's a regular uh, listener to our show, uh, is drone shows are mainly analog. Are you talking basically about all just digital? No, no, no. I think that uh, uh, the attacks that was there is not a basic simple attack of jamming, by the way, which is not blocking the analog shows. It was more sophisticated. I mean, after case analysis that they've done on and by the industry, uh, found out that was a very sophisticated attacks of uh, manipulations and different manipulation tools that were used in order to overcome those challenges. And uh, they will always find other tools that they can download from the web or other means to access those shows or other platforms and enter. By the way, some of the attacks that we've seen are not related at all to the communication on GPS. Some of the attacks attacking the operating system. And the vulnerabilities in the operating system, much like any computer that we are having or any other system that we are holding, 
through that they either disable capabilities or protection levels or enter inside and can do whatever they want. So vulnerabilities exist by different means of attacks. I can name some of them. And we will all understand that the level of security that exists today is in drones or robotics, both in the defense side as well as in the commercial side, is close to zero. And as we will see more and more of those uh, events happening, few of them. Just imagine a Walmart or Amazon or Google Wing operation that, of delivery that will fail a few times and someone will kidnap a drone. It will get to the news and the risk and the bad publicity it will take will be very, very, um, let's say, troubling. And you have to protect yourself. Absolutely. I think this kind of, or and this gets to your comment about being multifaceted, this idea that, you know, there's different threat vectors that, that you know, there's different uh, threat vectors. So you can attack the operating system, the controller, um, you, the ground control station, the actual connection between the GCS and the drone and the drone itself as kind of being a, you know, kind of an operating system, if you will, right out there. Um, I want to, I want to kind of split a, a hair here for a second because you actually are the CEO of two different companies, and I want to just be clear. You know, so you've got Mobilicom and you've got Skyhopper. Can you ex uh, explain the difference between those two companies and also the synergy between those two companies for everybody, so they understand what's out there? So when we started, we started with Mobilicom, and Mobilicom um, was getting a lot of attention and uh, requirement for mainly the, the first early adopters of technologies of drones, robotics, and platforms like that, which is government business. That was military, that was uh, agencies of government, that was public safety and such like. And they are using most sophisticated elements of that Mobilicom is providing. It could be sophisticated because it has different features and capabilities to operate, which are not always not now needed by commercial market or, or back then. It could be more sophisticated because the um, um, environmental condition that they have to operate are higher. It could give different, uh, more sophisticated tools to analyze, operate, uh, operate without GPS, operate without synchronization. Many many features that are there, and we've built array of different products in Mobilicom that is catering mainly for that market that is either used by enterprises or by government. Okay. We have witnessed that subset of those technologies could be in smaller form factor, cheaper prices, um, more adaptable capabilities to the civilian market uh, are much needed as the civilian market growing. And yep. then we created Skyhopper. Skyhopper is very, very aligned to the markets of uh, commercial markets mainly. Funny enough is once we started to push Skyhopper to those markets, we identified that they are using that also in the government business. Sorry, my outlet is Oh, the out. smaller drones, in other words. Yeah, what we've need, witnessed is that first we've done it and pushed that to the commercial market and Skyhopper is very in the designs of the products and the solution cater for the prices, the sizes, the power output, the capabilities, the simplicity of operation uh, that commercial need, okay? And that was the differentiation. So we are very much aligned to your strategy of uh, dual use and understanding that there is need uh, for both. Uh, but as I mentioned, capabilities of small drones or robotics push even the armies to take the scarper flavors, to have masses capabilities with advanced uh, operation, but smaller form factor sizes and weight. And Absolutely. I mean, we're we're seeing that across, right, globally across all the militaries, including in the U.S. Right, the the Army's got their uh, future tactical UAS program. Um, you know, the United States Air Force has its blue blue small UAS program now. UAS program kind of going a little bit with larger drones, but this idea of having you know tactical cyber secure. Uh, you know, drones out there for the soldier, sailor, air, marine, and in this case, and, and now uh, we got guardians, right, for our space force. But I want to, I want to peel back this, uh, this ICE product, which, by the way, acronym alert, uh, that stands for Immunity, Cybersecurity, and Encryption, ICE. Uh, and Oren, you said it, it, it uh, detects, it prevents, it responds to ten different types of attacks. You know, cyber threats and uh, interruptions. 
let's talk about the prevention piece or the detection piece first. And I, I, know, I was just so amazed when you talked to us in Clubhouse about the fact that even before a drone takes off, that your system is kind of, let's call it sniffing the area. Can you explain that kind of initial detection on the ground before pre-flight and then as the drone continues to fly? So do we have different means that analyze the environment that the drone is operating at? or and then operators or users or uh, viewers of that data that sometimes coexist in different in the same area and we found that um, once you are operating a drone you would like a simple operator that does not understand technology to have the easiest way to understand what is going on to identify for him the threats to choose for him automatically how and what to use and then avoid some attacks or protect him from side, side attacks. He doesn't know that it's happening. It gives him some identification. For example, when you're operating multiple systems simultaneously, let's say investigating the border, let's assume that you have imaginary border between Mexico and United States and you want to operate it. Okay. And then you have multiple teams across the border. Some of them are closer coming in and out from same uh, launch pads and so on. So you opening your drone and the a drone is sensing the environment. The send the, you can sense different elements. You can sense your environment of GNSS re reception and quality. You can sense the quality of the links and the RF and the uh, frequency uh, bands that you're working on and so forth. And then they can identify who are the friendly of, uh, elements around me that operating next to me that I, those are friends, but still can either, uh, I should coexist with them and operate, although they are in the area and emit a lot of uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, elements or communication and know how to work with them and choose between us the right uh, frequencies, channels, capabilities, and so on. And who are the, let's call them the enemies or those that are trying to uh, challenge the operation by different ways of jamming, spoofing, attacks, and so on. And I have to identify that. And by that, I'm operating sensing before the flight. And then once that is done, they are closing the sets of parameters. They are creating some coding between themselves. They are providing some bonding between the users and viewers of that mission. And they are creating different tools of protection that enables you to start the mission and be protected. And then as you operate in the mission, things are getting further away. You can have multiple drones crossing the borders or further away on the line and viewing elements and headquarters on the move that are, want to see the signal. All of them are collecting the threats among themselves. They are sharing the threat level in different spaces is different. And they are making cognitive joint decision of how to change, adapt according to the changes in the threats in the environment. And that's using capabilities of cognitive radios and other schemes to operate automatically against those threats, identify them, and then change, shift, adopt to those changes. And those algorithms that are running in the back of the mind of those uh, smart uh, systems that we have are making decisions together and detecting the threats that they have, announcing those to the operators and viewers, preventing the attacks by changing different schemes of their operation and codes and protections, and then response if they feel that it's too dangerous, uh, they can come back or they can go down or they can uh, change route in order to avoid such threats or continue with their mission. Wow. You know, I just want to foot stomp something. So, you know, th there's a lot of discussion across the U.S. military about, you know, operators, you know, task saturation and using artificial intelligence and autonomy to really reduce that workload on the operator. I believe you said that your system then autonomously in the background will kind of make these shifts. So that's, I think that's really significant and they'll, and it does it in real time. So can you talk to us a little bit about this idea of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and how you've programmed and plugged this into uh, your ICE system for cybersecurity? Uh, one of the things, for example, that we identify that you need a very smart tools in order to adopt, learn, and react uh, is when we looked on the threats of uh, hijacking and spoofing. 
when you are having a hijacking a spoofing attacks, for example, on your platform, or for example, on your uh, location and synchronization elements that are using GPS, Galileo, and other means, you identify that the biggest problem is I, I, I listen, I see a GPS signal. Is it true or false? Yeah. Is what I'm seeing is something which is a, a getting from the real system or is something that someone injects to the environment to manipulate me? And then after you're doing that, let's assume that I'm working with the right one. Can someone on the way start to manipulate me slowly and give me different timing and different locations adjustment that could be, you know, a few uh, inches in the beginning and less than that. And then as you move on, divert him from, from my mission and so on. So you don't really pay attention to that. And the system, the operators and others don't identify it. how you can learn that something is happening. So we have understood that we have to gather a lot of data from the drone or robot. This data is using and sensing multiple sensors and elements across the drone flight controllers and different INS elements and different activities and abnormalities. So sensing tons of data on a second, analyzing them, understanding by the power of multimodal AI machines that things are changing and shifting and someone is creating something in the background. And then you are starting to create the flashlight. I, I just want to interrupt real quick because just to kind of keep this simple for simple people like me, you know, if I'm operating your system, you, you kind of created this almost like uh, stoplight chart, right? Like, okay, things are green right now. Oh, I, uh, the system sense maybe a little bit of something, an anomaly. We're, we're now maybe yellow. And then you go red, uh, orange, like, okay, we've got a couple of these now. And then outright red, and that's when the system decide, you know, basically decides with a human on the loop, um, we're going to land this thing. Uh, because something we, is seriously wrong here. Yeah, so we, we, we not just identify the threats and multiple threats. We also understand and we, we warn you about the threat. And then in some cases we can take control and say, you know what, you don't fly this thing because you don't really push the right things or the system and the action and what you are getting is not true. Let me control of the mission. I can either control the mission and co continue to execute it until the threat will be stopped. I can get you back home, although you don't have GPS or GNSS with our capabilities, I can land you safely or do different things according to what our customers wants us to do. So first is sensing, second alerting, third is taking action, and sometimes taking control because when you're operating one drone is one thing, but when you're operating a fleet, no man can control a fleet of, of 10 or tens of drones simultaneously. So right. someone has to take an action and those smart computers and sensing and algorithms and AIs are the powerful tools that can manipulate all the information simultaneously and then make decision and operate those fleets to safe operation. And yep. this is some of the technologies that we've created around the eyes um, and bringing the best of read that exists and helping today government. But we've seen the needs on the commercial aspect as well. And I'm sure that th those will go higher and higher as more compelling events will happen. And this is one piece of the puzzle of the elements that Mobilicom provide among the end-to-end -end offering to our partners and customers. Yes, absolutely. You've got a full suite of products. And by the way, Oren, I wanted to mention, Rob Cranston is out there uh, watching us right now saying, hey, great discussion. Would love to meet up at AUVSI 2022. Uh, how are you storing routing workflow data sets for clients? First question. And then the second question is, how are you integrating data from existing clients or third party comm systems as it gets more complex? Um, so, first thing I want to tell Rob is Mobilicom is going to be at AUVSI 2022. So, uh, very excited to have them there. I think that's correct. And, uh, Oren, I don't know if you can answer that question. How are you storing routing workflow data sets for clients and integrating that third party communication information as well? And I believe you, yeah, there you go. So, we have, um, well, Obviously, um, I'm choosing carefully uh, and telling you what we are able to do and what we are doing and not exactly how we are doing those things because right, those are patents and, and, and secret sources that we don't sure. want to reveal to others. Of and in course. some cases, we don't want to give the bad guys the understanding of how those things to be done. 
because then they have ability to jeopardize that. But on one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, inviting each and one, every one of you to meet with us on ABUSI or in earlier cases in the United States and be glad to share with you what we can do for you in order to uh, take your uh, protection grade to much higher levels. Um, in a nutshell, I can say that uh, the cyber solution is built in a way that you can embed it on different elements of the entire drone system. It can sit on your ground control stations. It can sit on your drone segment. It can also help you with the cloud capabilities. Uh, having one solution of cyber protecting one of the assets of the drone system is not the right way. You have to think about it as a comprehensive end-to-end -end approach. And then what we do best is take responsibility and, and make sure that your entire system is operating under those security clearances and capabilities. And we can offer that by helping you with some of your segments and adding our secret sauce or uh, offer you some of our pieces that we have on the cloud, on the control, on the data link, on the cyber and so on. So you can take something which is already integrated well together, proven and safeguard you from all cases. Uh, if you choose to do so, it's your choice. Take one piece or multi pieces from us that are designed to work well. In a, in a nutshell, it's very similar to people that are using iPhone and then they are buying the, uh, their, their iPad and their uh, iWatch and other elements and they can be sure that they are integrated well. The safety and clearance and protection and scheme, the procedures are making it the best, both in performance, quality and security. And that's why the end-to-end -end is working for our customers, not for us, because yep. they can ensure faster time to market, lower price level, and better optimize quality and performance. Yeah, so I know you have a tiered approach, but you know, I mean, you raise a great point, Oren. It's almost like, again, keeping it simple for people like me. <laughs> you know, you have a house, it's like, you know, locking your front door, not your back door, right? Like, so someone's gonna come in because you didn't protect that, you know, the back of your house. and. Um, I could see where maybe in the beginning, a smaller company might at least want to start on the most likely, most risky scenario, start there and kind of build up. Now at the UVSI, uh, you, are you all going to be doing a demonstration there as well? I mean, I think you have a booth or what exactly are you doing there? Just to let people know, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, where they can find you here at AUVSI and beyond that, how they can reach you. So first, uh, people can reach our, our team members in Europe, in uh, um, in United States, and in Israel and in Australia. So we are scattered around the world. So we have pe people on the ground on all areas can, that can come visit, help, and support. We do it with our partners on a, on a weekly base. Uh, so please approach us, and we'll be healthy and glad to help. Second, we are coming to ABUSI, and we are coming to some events before that. I don't have all the names, but uh, Christina from the marketing can help us on that uh, later on. So if you want to meet earlier, um, I think that demonstrating, we can show the tools that are involved in our solutions over there. And the tools give you the different protection sets that you are having in the different labels and tiers that you can choose from and what are they are doing on layman terms, because some of the technology aspects don't help the operator to understand, okay, what is this bonding pairing coding thing that you mentioned for engineers? Oh, it's give you data data disk capabilities. I understand now. So we have those tools that help you understand the protection grade that you're having against the different tools and attacks. This we can show, we cannot operate the entire ice over there, obviously, because you have to show uh, and operate different teams of attacks that can manipulate others on the show, which we don't want or not allowed to do, obviously, <laughs> according to federal laws in the United States. And I do love to come to the United States, but I also would like to go back home. I don't <laughs> want to find myself in prison. So we yeah. will not demonstrate lab attacks on, on that, but we can help others to show them. If we do one-on-one -on -one in your company, we can easily can show how we spoof you, how you hijack you, how we take control of things and then show you how our system is working and give you the, the needed aid. Um, I think that um, more important also in ABUSI, we will show the end-to-end -end offering. 
um, those of that will need to have and, and, and would like to choose from the array of solution and understand the services that we can give them in order to expedite, accelerate their time to market, give them something which is solid working and proven by others, as well as the fact that they can utilize our knowledge in the system grade to help them bring them the uniqueness or unique selling points that they're having in this market. Yeah, One thing so, that I can uh, share I, with you. Go ahead, Oren. One thing I can share with you is that we've seen a difference, a difference between US and Europe, while uh, the civilian market in Europe already starting to speak cyber threats. So you can see some of the unique selling points of some civilian companies as well as government companies uh, in the drone uh, space in Europe saying cyber, saying protection, saying different buzzwords of things. It exists over there. We don't see that in the United States, and we would like to bring that to the US as well. And we've seen the standardization body in Europe that release uh, the drone regulation across the 28 countries of Europe, uh, that the, the appendixes over there are already speaking about the challenges of security and the requirement that they mandate in order to operate civilian operations in European skies. So yeah. pay attention to that. If you are not familiar with the changing regulations and rules that are coming, we will be able to help you identify those and bring you up to date and help you close the gap. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're referring to uh, the U-Space Regulation Appendix 3 that addresses cyber specifically. And we're pretty much out of time here, uh, Oren. Man, did time fly today. Uh, I do want to just mention everybody, uh, you know, Mobilicom's cybersecurity solution is already integrated into 70 different time, types of drones, robots, autonomous systems across all kinds of different markets, including public safety, security, disaster relief, maritime, uh, and UAVs and robotics. So just to kind of foot stomp the fact that they're already out there, they're already doing it. It's so excited for you all to come to the United States. Uh, and and plant the flag here. I can't wait to meet you in person. I think we answered this, but I, I'd, I'd be remiss not to ask this real quick, even though we're kind of out of time. So thanks for everybody for with bearing with us. Um, uh, someone on LinkedIn has asked, is it possible for clients to use their own bespoke encryption together with your solutions? Um, what is the answer to that question, Warren? Encryption is a very important piece of the puzzle. Yes, you, we have to enable others to bring their own secret sauce as well. Uh, obviously, it has to be with a very close cooperation and joint work. For example, if you want to implement PIPs 1.4.2 or 3, or so you, it, it's American flavors that American companies can bring. So we have to enable that, and we do acknowledge that and enable that. So one of the elements of the entire tools that we're having could come from another source, like encryptor from America or encryptor from other places. So yes, we are open to that. We are willing to do it and we gladly cooperate with others. Well, awesome. I mean, that's what we call plug and play, right? Which is what really your holistic end-to-end -end solutions are all about anyway. So Warren, thank you so much for taking this time to talk about the importance of cybersecurity, the fact that literally uh, you're, what you are doing at Mobilicom with the ICE 360 solution is literally battle tested. Uh, it's been proven on the battlefield, uh, on the borders, in civilian sector. So excited to have you come to the US. That's a real great segue. Just real quick, everybody, to mention that, you know, join us at AUVSI. I mean, I'm running a one day Law Tech Connect workshop on Monday, April 25th that's gonna talk about all these different laws. In fact, today I, I put up some information about our AI panel that's gonna get into cybersecurity. Uh, people like Brigadier General United States Army retired Pat Houston, who's a renowned world expert on artificial intelligence policy and law. So just one example of so many uh, amazing faculty members. So please sign up for that. Uh, real quick tomorrow, as we continue dual use technologies month, we're uh, pleased to announce that on Clubhouse, we will have uh, Shern Peters, the CEO of Nanco Aero out of Houston, Texas. They're creating really incredible small and large EV tall, uh, basically flying cars uh, that can be used both in the civilian and military sectors. They have big ideas, big sites. So join us tomorrow. And, and of course, Shern will be on this podcast next week. Uh, so I think that's all she wrote. Oren, I'm going to give you the last 30 seconds to end with whatever you want to say. 
No, no, I'm very pleased that we joined you and we spoke about that. We would like to raise awareness of the threats that exist over there and help our partners and customers and others to protect themselves so their entire industry, industry that we are working at, at could flourish and jump. And, and we have to enable that. And we are giving some pieces that will enable this uh, ramp up. Well, awesome. And thank you so much for explaining all of this. I can't wait to meet you in person. And for everybody out there, thanks for joining us. And for those pilots that are out there, fly safe. Bye-bye.